All right, this is Honors Algebra 2 Pre-Calculus, and we are doing section 4.3, uh, which is the inverse of a matrix. But this is actually not about a matrix uh, at this point. What we're doing in this third video, and it's totally optional, you can bail on it if you want. It is not going to be on a test. Uh, it is not going to be, you know, material from our class at all. It's just going to be a little talk about crypt cryptography. So uh, right now you're watching this lesson on the Internet, right? The internet is all about cryptography. Data is encrypted in many different ways, some better than others, right? To keep your banking information safe and your social security number safe and all sorts of information safe, right? Uh, your passwords and all sorts of things. So every day there are people trying to find ways to break codes. That's not new, uh, but I thought it would be kind of fun to talk about some of the techniques used throughout history, specifically the ones uh, that were done by hand, right? So, there, um, so we're going to walk through two of the methods uh, famous in history that were done by hand. The first one we're going to do is the Caesar cipher, which is a single substitution uh, or a monoalphabetic substitution, right? Uh, and the next one's going to be the Visionnaire cipher, uh, which I'm probably saying terribly, but it sounds kind of like the word Visionnaire and it is French and I am very much not French. So uh, by the middle of the 20th century, encoding machines like the Enigma, which you'll see uh, if you've ever watched the movie The Imitation Game, with, uh, which is about Alan Turing, uh, uh, lots of other there's there's lots of other things but during uh, World War II uh, the Enigma machine became very famous and there are other versions uh, counterparts that were in America that were very famous so eventually a lot of these types of by hand ciphers uh, were replaced right uh, cryptanalysis is the art or science of decoding encrypted messages without the key right so basically code breaking it's a fi uh, fancy way to say code breaking uh, and it's a fascinating field that frequently draws mathematically talented folks who can often discern patterns where other people see chaos, uh, which some of you might be those people. And it's a pretty cool uh, thing to go into. So I thought we'd just walk through some of these by hand methods for breaking or for encrypting data uh, over history. So, uh, so let's start with the Caesar cipher. So the Caesar cipher is named uh, after Julius Caesar. Uh, so we're going to use that same message that we use in another video. We're going to use math is awesome, and we're going to talk about how to uh, encode something with a Caesar cipher. So essentially, a Caesar cipher, if you look down here, was uh, was basically two rotating disks, right? And one of them was the original letter, like the plain text, right? And one of them was the cipher letter. So for instance, in this case, if you look, right, um, in this one, you can see uh, what is aligned by the disks, right, that like, a is aligned with N in this image, right? And so, so you would be able to essentially shift the text, just like they're showing up here, right here, they're showing where E is shifted to B, right? Um, but essentially it, it shifts the text, so each letter is replaced by a different letter, right? Um, and not only a different letter, but a different letter in sequence. So if you shift B, uh, if E becomes B, then the letter before E, which is D, becomes A, right? Um, so the problem with the Caesar cipher, with this, this mono, uh, mono alphabetic substitution, is that things like frequency tables, right, to see that the letter E is the most common in the English language, they're going to show over a long piece of information, like a long message, they're going to show that the most frequent letters are such and such, and you're going to be able to kind of start to guess and check and say, well, if the most frequent letters are these five letters, let's try the five most frequent letters in the English language and see if that's them. And then we can kind of reverse engineer the message from there. And once you start, honestly, once you find one letter correctly, because the letters are substituted in order, it's pretty easy to reverse engineer and figure it out. But let's go ahead and encode something. Uh, we're going to encode using uh, a Caesar cipher, right? So basically what, what the Caesar cipher does is if we want the letter M, we wouldn't use M, we would use J, right? So, so this would be J, right, for the M, right? A lines up with X, so J, X, right? T in the original lines up with Q, right? Um, H in the original lines up with E, right? Um, I in the original lines up with F. S in the original lines up with P, right? Uh, we already saw that A was X, so there's my S and my A. Uh, w lined up with T, right? E lines up with B. Uh, w, E, uh, S we already saw lines up with P, right? O lines up with L. M lines up with J, which we already saw from the math part. Uh, and E lines up with B, which we already saw. Okay, so there would be the encrypted message that you would send, right? And that's fine. Um, and it looks like gibberish, right? But, um, but essentially, a Caesar cipher is fairly easy to crack if you get used to looking at ciphers like this. So, um... 
a Caesar cipher is sort of the basis uh, for what we're going to do next, which is the Visionaire cipher. Uh, so the Visionaire cipher is sort of like multiple rounds of Caesar cipher, right? So let's go ahead and look at this slightly more complicated cipher just to show you how it works. So a Visionaire cipher um, essentially is similar to using a Caesar cipher over and over again. So here's the idea. You have your, your phrase, math is awesome, which in this case has 13 characters. And you're going to pick a keyword like the word nerd, right? Which is shorter than the message. The message was 13 characters, nerd is only four characters. You're then going to create this key stream, which is basically the key repeated over and over again. So nerd, 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 and then N when you run out, right? Okay. So here's how this works, and it's going to take us a minute to do it, but it's kind of cool. Um, and you can imagine how long it took to encode messages and why it was important to be precise, why you would have messages that say things like, go north, instead of messages that say, hi, Fred, how are you today? How's the wife? Would you like to decode my message? Like, you're not going to write an essay because this takes a while, right? Okay, so here's how it's going to work. I have these letters on the top, like the letter M, which is the letter I want, right? And then I have these rows. Each one of these rows is a Caesar cipher, right? The Caesar cipher A is where A is shifted to A. So notice that it, there's no shift at all. The, C, the row B is where A is shifted to B, and then everything subsequently shifts. The row, the row C is where A is shifted to C, and then everything shifted subsequently. So each one of these rows represents a Caesar cipher, right? Okay. So here's the idea of how this works. For, for M, I'm going to use the nth row. So I'm going to go to row N, which is right here, okay? I'm going to go to row n, and I'm going to go to where m is, which is right here, and I'm going to use this z, okay? So, so this m used row n and encoded to z, right? Now, to encode the a, I'm going to use row e. So I'm going to go to e, and you'll notice the nice thing about my key is I'm only using four rows. I actually only need the e row the N row, the R row, and the D row, right? So, so the E row, I'm going to go ahead and use E, the E row to encode A. Well, the E row to encode A is just going to encode as E, right? Now I need the R row to encode the T, right? So I'm going to use the R row. So I go to the R row, right? So here's the R row, and I want to encode T. Well, this is T right here. T in the R row is going to be a K. Right, and even doing that, I have to double check that I lined it up right. Okay, so there's my, my K, right? And then to do the H, right, and I'm trying to use a different color on purpose, but you can see how long this takes. So to do the H, I'm going to use the D row, which is right here. So my D row, I'm going to go across D until I get to where H would be, and H is a K. So notice that both those letters ended up being K, but in very different ways. Then I'm going to loop back to the N row, to this N row, right? So now I'm back to the N row right, because that's the next part of the key. So, so for the n row, I'm going to look for i. So I go across the n row here, and my i is a v, right? And then I'm going to go ahead and go to the e row again, right? The e row is what I'm going to use for the, for the s. So I go to the s in the e row. So this is the e row, and it's a w, right? So I get a w, right? And then I'm going to go back to the R row. I think I used red for the R row. So the A, I'm going to go to the R row. Now, the nice thing about A is A just encodes as whatever the letter of the row is. So A is going to encode as R. And you saw that before when we did A in the E row. It just encoded as uh, A. So A always encodes as whatever the letter is, which is nice. Okay. Uh, after the red, I used purple, right? So then I'm going to go to the D row for W, right? So I go to the D row, and I'm going to go till I get to W which is a Z in the D row. So that's a Z, right? Uh, and then I'm going to loop back to my, to my green, right? I'm going to loop back to the N row, and I'm going to look for E. Now, you'll notice I kind of am cheating here a little bit, but I noticed that both of these are in the N row, and they're both E's, so I'm just going to skip to that and be happy that I can do it. So in the E row, or sorry, in the N row, my bad, uh, N row, E is A, B, C, D, E is R. So these are both R's because I'm being lazy and they happen to be the same letter in the same row. So I was able to be lazy. Okay, next I'm going to use blue for the E row, right? So my E row, and I want S in the E row. Well, it looks like I already had an S in the E row, right? It was a W, which is convenient. That worked out well that I had an S in the E row. That's nice. Um, next in red, I want the R row, right? So, so R, like I go to the R row and I want O. So here's the R row and I want O. O, which I'm pretty sure is an F. 
right? And so again, you would pick a much bigger version of this table. I had to make it pretty small so that you could see the whole thing. It would have been much smarter if I had just copied and pasted those two rows that I, or those four rows that I actually needed, but I was not that clever. So here we are suffering with my old eyes. And then I'm gonna go to the D row and I wanna look up M. So I go to the D row, I look up M and it's a P. So this right here, this crazy, that is my encoded message. And that is how you use a Visionier cipher. So a Visionier, sorry, Visionier cipher. Uh, and this is called a Visionier square or Visionier table. It can also be called a tabula recta. Um, so that's the idea. It's basically a Caesar cipher for each individual letter, different shift to a different Caesar cipher. Now what a person would need in order to do this is they would need this key and that's really it right? And they would have this table. And if they didn't have this table, they could create this table, but it's not super fun to create this table, right? Um, but that's the idea. That's how this works. So anyway, that was just a fun little side note uh, about some cool ciphers that you can do by hand. Also worth uh, Googling. Uh, you should check out some, some cool stuff about encryption uh, and, and about cryptanalysis. Um, the Friedmans, right? So, um, so things to check out if this is a thing that you, see, that you think are interested, uh, interesting. So you could check out um, the imitation game. Right, so the imitation game is a movie. It's also, I believe it's based on a book, right? So, so I think it's a movie and a book. Um, the movie uh, has uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. I'm not even gonna try and spell that, but he was uh, Dr. Strange. He's also Sherlock, um, but it's about Alan Turing, who is uh, basically considered to be the, the founder of modern computers, the, the way that we're used to them. Uh, you can look up the Enigma machine, right? Um, so, So if you um, if you look up the Freedmans as well, so they were um, they're U.S. code breakers, uh, husband and wife. Uh, they were sort of the founders of this field of cryptanalysis. They were or at the very forefront of cryptanalysis. Uh, it's super interesting. There's a there's a book called The Woman. I think it's The Woman Who Smashed Codes, uh, or something like that. Uh, it's something akin to that, but it's pretty cool. So anyway, if you're interested. Um, Cryptanalysis is a field, and it's, it's a field for people that are great at math. And you don't have to be great at math, but it's really helpful. Um, if you're somebody who loves crosswords or finding patterns in chaos or math in general or any of that stuff or just kind of puzzling through things, it's a pretty cool field to look into. So you should think about it. All right, uh, that's it for this optional video. Bye, people.